Okay, so it's 2.02, so I think we'll go ahead and uh, kick things off. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, I'm Hilary Critelli. I'm the Director of Development for the American Literal Society. Um, you get a lot of emails from me, so thank you for being here uh, with us today to learn about um, the Osprey Restoration in Jamaica Bay with our Northeast Chapter Director, Don Reapy. He's going to um, take us through the journey of the Osprey and the American Literal Society's role and his role in making sure that they have a home in Jamaica Bay um, after they were gone for a while. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to watch a couple of videos, um, so hopefully we we'll, won't have any technical difficulties with that. Um, but bear with us. I know you've probably all been on a lot of webinars and Zoom. Uh, so, you know, we're all traversing this virtual landscape together. Um, and then we will have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A box and we'll go through them uh, at the end of our presentation. So Don. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into the slides? Okay, well, you know, uh, Don Reapy, a longtime member of the Literal Society, and uh, I've been involved with them since the early 80s. Started the uh, Northeast chapter here. And um, in 1990, we uh, realized that. Uh, Ospreys are making a comeback, even though we had no nesting ospreys in New York City at that time. So we started putting up uh, platforms and uh, each year we got more and more ospreys. And now we have 25, at least 25 nesting, active nesting pair in Jamaica Bay, which is kind of interesting. That, that picture, that's the, uh, the biggest and best marsh in Jamaica Bay. That's Joko Marsh. And at the top left, you notice the runway of uh, Kennedy Airport. So that's one of our issues in Jamaica Bay that we have a, a big international airport on one end. And we're surrounded by a lot of development. So it's been a tough life for uh, lots of the bird life in the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. But we managed to uh, actually bring this bird back from, from zero, as I said, in 1990 to, to today we have uh, at least 25 active nesting pair. So um, I guess we're going to show the a video at this point. Uh, there, there it is, hopefully it works. <laughs> Hi, I'm Don Reapy, the Jamaica Bay Guardian for the American Little Society. Today we're going out into Jamaica Bay to look at one of the most amazing raptors of New York City. We're here in Jamaica Bay on Joko Marsh, the biggest and best marsh in the bay. And I'm standing next to a uh, a platform nest of ospreys. The osprey is a large fish-eating hawk whose population had been decimated by DDT in the environment. DDT interfered with their ability to produce calcium. They would sit on eggs, they would break. But since DDT was banned by executive order by Richard Nixon, I believe it was 1972, uh, the osprey has started making a comeback. So in 1990, there were no nests in New York City. The first nest occurred in Jamaica Bay. Once we saw the ospreys were making a comeback, we started putting up more nest sites for them. Today we have 25 nesting pair in Jamaica Bay, so this bird is fully restored to the bay. This very fierce looking predator is actually pretty docile. They really never attack people. Um, they're fish eating birds. We've tracked them uh, we had a GPS harness on at least two different birds 
One went to Venezuela in the winter, the other went to Colombia. So they travel great distances in the winter to their winter grounds. Then they come back here in early spring. So these three birds should be flying in about a week or two at most. They learn how to hunt, how to catch fish. So they're almost fully grown. It's just beautiful. You notice the, the reddish eyes. It, it's a really beautiful bird. So we're here at a second nest uh, in Jamaica Bay. It's on the yellow bar hassock. This was actually the site of the first nesting pair of ospreys for New York City in most of last century. So in 1991, we had our first nest on the other side of this island. This is a fairly new nest, and we have uh, two young birds up here, about four weeks old or so. Um, just to give you an example of what they're feeding on, <laughs> here's the remains of a sea robin, <laughs> uh, half-eaten sea robin that uh, actually a, more of a bottom fish that they brought into the nest. Their main prey is actually menhaden, a surface feeding fish. But we'll leave this here. They can finish that a little later. How are we doing? Let's see, these birds should be banded. Here's one. Here's one he's got, ouch, okay. Easy, easy. Yeah, he's got his two bands on. Easy. This is a young bird. But look at those talons. Those talons are geared for grasping fish. So we have two beautiful birds here. So they're, they're about uh, five and a half weeks old, I'd say. They need another two weeks before they'll, at least before they'll be ready to fly. So here we are with New York City in the background. Um, right here in Jamaica Bay. Who would believe that we have such a magnificent raptor such as the osprey? This one is pretty feisty. So this has been a very successful year for the osprey. We're most of the nests have three young, which may be due to uh, a good population of menhaden in the bay. Okay. I'm holding a menhaden or a bunker, a surface feeding fish that is one of the most important fish in the sea. It is also the prime food resource for the osprey. Since it's a surface fish, they're easier to catch. When we had the first nest in 1991, and since then we've been banding almost every year. So we're at the Ruler's Bar Marsh today, and this is the latest nest. We put this up with our restoration call last year. We have two young in this nest. They're about five and a half to six weeks old. Okay. And we put two different bands on these birds. These are the two bands that we use. Okay. The silver band is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band. That goes on the right leg. And the left leg is the Jamaica Bay green band, which has a number and a letter. So presumably, uh, people seeing these in the field can read them from a distance, and we can get information as to where they go in winter, for example, where they go and travel and forage around the bay, how long they live. So what I'm going to do is just very carefully pick up one of the young and cradle them in my arms. Just being a little bit careful for the uh, talons, they are a little bit sharp. And you can see here with the osprey, they have toe arrangements where there's two up and two down. A little bit different from most of your perching birds, which usually have three toes in one direction and one in the other. So these birds, <clears throat> these birds are designed for catching and eating fish. As far as I know, that's 99% uh, of their prey. Uh, they may take advantage of something else uh, on occasion, but 
For the most part, they're strictly fish-eating bird. Okay. Your movement should be very, very slow. Very, very slow. I'll let him bite me. That's fine. I don't mind that. He's biting. Yeah. Yeah, Chris doesn't mind if they bite him, and, and I don't mind if they bite him either, so uh, <laughs> it's fine. <clears throat> wow. So I'm going to readjust him just to fold his wings a little bit better Ooh. so he doesn't get hurt. Okay. There we go. There we well, go. It's like a dog or a cat when the hair on the, yeah. and the neck or head goes up. It's like getting my hackles up, mm. you know, the feathers in the back of the head. Okay. And you're done. You're all done. I'm going to let him stretch his wings once again. Get a little stretch here before I put him back in the nest. Okay. Beautiful. And there. So we're all done. Hi, I'm Don Rippey, the Jamaica Bay Guardian and Director of the Northeast Chapter of the American Literal Society. And I'm Alex Sablocki, the Executive Director of the Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy. For the past 20 years, groups like ours have been protecting and restoring habitats in and around Jamaica Bay. But a lot more needs to be done and we could use your help. Consider volunteering to help us improve the bay. As nonprofit organizations, we are grateful for any monetary contributions you can make to help us in these efforts. Finally, we invite you to share this video with your friends. And we invite everyone to come down to the bay and explore the world of wonders that we have right here in our own backyard. Together we can protect and restore Jamaica Bay. introduce this next video before I play it? Yeah, this, this year, this year we, uh, we didn't get to all the nests and some of them are, are quite difficult to get to. They're, one of them actually nesting on top of a crane, a few are nesting in, in big trees now, which is good, you know, getting to more natural nests. But this one had four young, which is really unusual. So they said we had, uh, a lot of good success in Jamaica Bay, and it's probably due to the fact we have a really good uh, resource here with lots of menhaden in and around the bay and, and right offshore in the ocean here. So these four young are ready, just they're about seven weeks old, I think, you know. Another week they'll be flying. So you can notice the, the band on the right leg of this one, the Fish and Wildlife Service band. So they're all banded, ready to go. So it's is this a little video? Predator like a bald eagle flying overhead. You may not see them so easily. That was out in uh, on one of the marsh islands in the bay, which is the stronghold for the ospreys. That that shows the different sites uh, that we have here. They're all within the bay. The top rightmost one is actually in Nassau County, and on the on the left side, the farthest left is actually. A New York City Park, that's the Salt Marsh Nature Center there in Gerritsen Creek. Uh, so you can see, uh, you can see Kennedy Airport on the, on the right. Uh, so we have this huge international airport on the edge of the bay. And on the bottom left, you see uh, Floyd Bennett Field, uh, which is part of Gateway. It's New York City's first municipal airport, but it's not used uh, except for the uh, New York City helicopter unit there. Next. 
uh, gives you a, a look in that beautiful eye. You have incredible vision, these birds. Uh, can imagine flying several hundred feet above the water and spotting a fish and be able to dive, dive down and catch it. So it's, it's a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough thing to do. Next. So on the right, you see a plane taking off. Well, this is a, this is telephoto lens. So the birds and the plane are not as close as they appear, but it is a concern. And, uh, you know, we meet, you know, I meet regularly with the, the Port Authority people, the FAA and all the different regulatory uh, agencies twice a year at Kennedy Airport to talk about uh, management, how we can make the airport less attractive to birds so they don't go there, different things we can do. So, because uh, occasionally an osprey will get hit by a plane there, and that's a big bird. So we want to we want to reduce the, the impact of birds and planes, both for the flying public and for the birds themselves. So far, we've been pretty successful. Um, on the left, there, that's in one of the basins uh, in Rockaway there. You can see that Osprey is nesting on top of it, an unused crane as well. Next. <laughs> There's uh, Chris on the left side. Uh, occasionally the peregrine falcons will take over an osprey platform. So even though the peregrines are just about half the size of an osprey, they're twice as fierce. And they will actually kick off an osprey if they want. They normally don't like to nest on these plat open platforms. They, they prefer a bridge or building to nest. But, you know, unlike the ospreys, which never attack us, the peregrines, you can see that female peregrine is very aggressive, doesn't want him to be there, near that nest. So Chris had climbed up without a hard hat on, which he normally wears when he deals with peregrines, because he said he knew that bird. Uh, he said, I know that female, she's pretty docile. Well, anyway, she wheeled around in the back, she came down and she smacked him right in the back of the head with a talon and <laughs> drew blood. So he learned his lesson. In the middle one, you can see, uh, again, a, a telephoto lens close up of a peregrine with three young uh, birds in an osprey platform with the huge uh, jet looming overhead, which is at a great distance. But the telephoto lens brings the, the background close to the foreground. And this, this last winter, we had a pair of bald eagles hanging around the eastern section of the bay. And uh, here's a photo I took of them using an osprey platform hanging out and with the World Trade Center in the back there. They, so they hung around for a good part of the winter and then they disappeared. But it won't be too long before bald eagles may be nesting in Jamaica Bay somewhere. Uh, they do nest uh, in Staten Island and they're nesting in Nassau County. So they're, they're starting to increase in populations. All these uh, top of the line predators have increased because of protective measures uh, that was taken over the years. Next. And the banning of DDT, which really helped. On the left is uh, my boat. This was a nest that was very close to a little creek and I was able to take four of our, our little uh, Osprey Club members out there to get a close look at a, at a juvenile Osprey. And uh, then the other picture shows them with the Osprey looming in the foreground and, and I made it seem like it was a giant Osprey, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, focusing on Osprey. And, and they're getting enough depth of field to bring the background into. Next. So this this is our restoration core, a group of youths that we hire, you know, for the last seven years or so, we've been hiring about uh, anywhere between 15 to 20 young people during the summer. And uh, we paid them $15 an hour to get out and do work in the bay. They did a lot of marsh planting. You can see we're on a, a marsh on an island that we replanted. And here they're putting up, pulling up an osprey platform, a new one that was put up there. And uh, that was about at least five years ago. And every year since we've had ospreys nesting there. Next. 
Uh, years ago, uh, ospreys, uh, well, the first osprey nest was actually about 20 feet high. So all the poles were put in. We would float a, a big telephone pole out and get a, a, about 10 people a, with three ropes and pull it up and then we'd jet it in, into the marsh and down in there and uh, you know keep it high up. And then I found that ospreys were actually nesting almost on the ground. They would nest on anything, piece of debris. Uh, in one case, there was a big uh, garbage can turned on its side that they actually raised their young on. So, so a, a light went off in my head and I said, why are we building these huge uh, towers for them when they will nest low to the ground? As long as they're out in an area where there are no predators, like raccoons can get to them. These are marsh, isolated marsh islands. So those are the best sites for them. So you can see uh, on the right, that's the nest uh, on the right with the four young. And you can see they're starting to fly now. One of them is actually taking off. And on the left, you see an osprey was banded uh, a year before. He's got the Jamaica Bay band on the left foot and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife on the right foot. Next. Uh, left is just a beautiful picture I liked of a, a young osprey just about uh, ready to fly. So that's, that's a, about eight weeks or so that they're ready to go, maybe, maybe a little more in some cases. But they go from an egg and, and a tiny little baby, you know, just a few inches high, to a full-grown bird with a five-foot wingspan in just eight weeks. So that's a tremendous amount of growth. There's uh, Chris and my friend Dennis. Dennis uh, grabbing hold of a young osprey that flew out of the nest and we wanted to put him back in. Um, he landed on the boat. Dennis is uh, our, our carpenter and builds all our platforms for us. So he's one of our great volunteers. We also had uh, for many years Barbara Saunders from, uh, she's now the president of Linnaean Society. She works with DEC. She would come out and help with the banding. And this program uh, for the last couple of years has been funded by the Jamaica Bay Rockway Parks Conservancy. So we got a grant to work with not only the ospreys, but with barn owls. Barn owls, another raptor that needed, that is a species of concern in New York State. So we've had a lot of success with these birds, but it, it takes a lot of work and effort in maintaining and repairing and replacing these platforms that they need. Next. Yeah, there's the uh, uh, picture, a lucky photo I got of an osprey coming overhead. He's got a menhaden in his talons. So I mentioned menhaden. Uh, there's a book out called The Most Important Fish in the Sea. It's one of, it is one of the most important fish. It's a surface feeder, and they graze on the algae at the surface of the, uh, of the bay in the ocean, and they actually help clean, clean it up. And they provide food resource for dolphins, whales, and uh, ospreys, eagles, all top of the line predators. So, so we're, uh, we're glad that we have a good population of menhaden. We hope to keep it that way. Uh, the bottom, it shows you three, yeah, three young ospreys, just born, just uh, less than a week old there. And they have a, a menhaden in there that the parent will pick up, pick at and feed them. Next. And uh, this is the sunset in the bay, a photograph that I've always wanted to take. Catch the sun going down <coughs> and get it right behind to silhouette the uh, ospreys. This is uh, the pair out in a uh, yellow bar hassock. I believe that uh, I got lucky recently to get this photo. Next. Is another one that's uh, actually the same the same nest site. Looks like a couple of sunspots there. <laughs> Next. So there you have it. That's uh, one of our programs that we've been working on for thirty years, and so it's very successful. I'm very proud of uh, 
the fact that we're able to return the osprey to Jamaica Bay, it's fully restored now. So all we have to do is just monitor the, the population. In the middle there, you see Edgar the egret, uh, one of two great egrets that have adopted us, that would land on the dock and actually walk into the house here. And uh, on, on, the, on the far left is uh, a huge Hindu statue. Uh, so, <laughs> the beaches, uh, a lot of people come down, it's the local beaches here and they perform ceremonies and they leave the statues and unfortunately they leave some prayer flags and, and saris and things. So if you're trying to get them to clean up after you do your ceremony, make sure you take the debris out with you. That's uh, another program we have is uh, our coastal cleanup, which uh, we've been doing since 1986, every year. And so if you have any questions about um, Osprey and Jamaica Bay in general, uh, please put them in either the chat or the Q&A box um, so that we can have Don answer them. If you're interested in uh, volunteering or uh, learning more about the Literal Society in Jamaica Bay or otherwise, uh, Don's contact information is here. You can always reach him. Um, so we did have one question come in. Um, do you know Don? John I Des might butcher. Yeah, John Daskalakis. Oh yeah, John Daskalakis is uh, <clears throat> one of our great rangers that works out of Floyd Bennett Field and runs uh, kayak programs there. So John, uh, a few years back, was very uh, instrumental in getting. Uh, some large ticket items removed from Jamaica Bay, like boats and debris. So, uh, but he uh, runs the uh, kayak programs throughout the summer. I don't know if they're running, still running them right now, but we do have uh, kayak programs running out of uh, Beach 88th Street. There's a Beach 88th Street uh, kayak launch there. And uh, I will actually be doing a kayak uh, program leave on the 14th of August. Uh, hope I got the date right with uh, the Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy. So uh, we also had, uh, they also sponsored uh, a kayak trip for our restoration crew last week. So we will, we will take, uh, you know, people out in small numbers in that site. Uh, I see the other, I have not worked with Pete McLean from Island Beach State Park. No, I, I don't recall. He, he might have been involved in our uh, New York State Coastal Cleanup. So maybe uh, in 2014, maybe Natalie Grant had, she was our uh, beach cleanup coordinator back then. She might have known Pete. All right, so we've got some other questions coming in. Um, have you been out, Don, since the storm? How did the nest fare after um, yeah, everything, the tropical uh, storm? Well, I haven't been out around the bay since the storm. I do hope to get out soon. But it looks like, from what I can see from my dock here, the nest, the local nest, they, they did fine. You know, birds seem to do well, okay with these things. You know, storms, uh, this is part of what they deal with uh, almost on a daily basis, living out in, in nature. So we haven't had much of a problem. But I will check again to see uh, <clears throat> if we had any damage. Fortunately, most of the nests, the ospreys, have fledged by now. So, so they'll all be flying. And if any damages did happen to the platforms or the nests, will you guys um, repair them? Yeah, of course. We'll repair them. We do a lot of our repair work over the winter when the ospreys are gone. They usually leave, they start in uh, late September. E even now they're moving around. Uh, the juveniles are learning how to hunt. I guess the parents are helping them, teaching them. And then uh, they'll all head south and they'll go down to Florida, the Caribbean, and in even, even uh, Central and South America for the winter. But they'll come back to the same nest that they worked on. If they're successful, They'll come back the same pair. They do uh, mate for life. Even, even though they part in the winter, they will reconnect in the springtime. Usually uh, they're back in the late March, early April, 
everybody's back on the nesting platforms. Very good. Um, and Marilyn wants to know, um, she's at 121st and the boardwalk in Rockaway. She normally sees a lot of dolphins around this time of year, but has not seen any in six weeks. Do you know if there's a reason there's not around this summer? Uh, no, uh, I, I'm not sure what the reason would be. Probably would have to something, you know, maybe the Menhaden moved farther offshore. Uh, it's one of the fish that they feed on. Um, I haven't heard uh, of any major uh, problems with pollution or oil spills or things that might impact them. Um, some people thought that maybe uh, that the sharks have driven them away, but uh, I think they're used to dealing with sharks and they're, they're pretty good at, at actually driving the sharks away. From what have I, there been a lot of sharks this summer? I, I don't know if it's more than any other summer, but we did have, uh, that one fatal attack in Maine and with the Great White. And uh, since then, they've been using helicopters out in Nassau and Suffolk to check the waters and give people any alerts if there are sharks around. But, uh, you know, sharks are here every summer. And for the most part, uh, they don't really interact with people, but occasionally it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, so you're in a, in a wetsuit and look like a steel. Right. <laughs> So sort of a follow-up question with that is if there's a good population of menhaden um, and that affects the osprey so much, what affects the population of menhaden? Uh, well, the biggest threat to menhaden, well, aside from water quality, and we've, we've worked a lot on water quality issues here, you know, with the Clean Water Act and cleaning up the waters in Jamaica Bay and offshore Rockway. So that has helped, uh, you know, the fish stocks rebound. But we're also concerned about the uh, Menhaden, the Omega oil, fish oil industry, who come in with huge boats uh, and with purse stains, scoop up huge amounts of Menhaden to be ground up and used as fish oil. Years ago, they used them as fertilizer. Um, so that could be a serious issue. But we've managed, uh, the state actually keeps them at least three miles offshore. That's our, our state uh, coastal limit here. But um, we're keeping an eye on that. We want to make sure that uh, they don't come in. And this is a fleet that had come from Virginia all the way up north here. I guess they they wiped out the, the Menhaden farther south. There are limits. The the uh, there are limits as to the take, the amount of tonnage that, of Menhaden that they're allowed to take. Hopefully, uh, we if we're going to err, we err on the side of the resource. On the fishery, you know. Yeah. Um, and then are there many turtles in Jamaica Bay? Well, there are a lot of uh, little diamondback terrapins, although their populations have declined in, in the uh, western section of the bay here. According to uh, Russ Burt from Hofstra University, who's been studying them for many years, said there are two pretty much distinct populations, east side and west side populations. The west side population of terrapins are heavily impacted by an elevated number of raccoons that live around the city, around the shorelines. The raccoons get over 95% of the nests on these mainland islands. Uh, on some of the central islands in the bay, if there are no raccoons, the terrapins do okay. And apparently they do okay over by Kennedy Airport, although they have an issue of, of terrapins walking on the runways I mean, years ago, the pilots would report, hey, this, what's, this, what's going on here? There are a bunch of turtles on the runway. So the airport uh, had to deal with that and come up with a method of trying to keep the, the terrapins uh, from crossing the runways, you know. Um, as far as the other turtles, uh, occasionally we'll see a, a loggerhead or a leatherback turtle, but they're, they're pretty rare in the bay, green turtle. Um, we did have a, a nesting a Ridley's turtle at West Beach, just outside the, the entrance to the bay. That, that was uh, really rare. I think it's one of the, the northernmost nest of that particular species of turtle. Wow. Um, and then Sarah wants to know, are the nests reused by different breeding pairs on the platforms or is it the same 
pair that comes back no, to it's, the... It's the same pair. Uh, the two birds that we put transmitters on, the blue antennae, you can see the actual individual. They came back to the same nest in the next year. And so presumably it's if, if one of the pair dies, they'll find another mate, you know, but, uh, but otherwise they will, they'll use the same nest over and over again. And they can live as long as, you know, anywhere from 15 to 25 years in the wild. Wow. Um, and an update on the kayaks. Um, apparently they're not running this year, John's kayak program due to COVID-19. Um, he, he tells people about the Osprey nest. So that's why that question came up. Yes, okay. Um, and then another question, are there any differences between the East Coast Osprey and the Pacific Northwest Osprey? And do we find banded East Coast birds anywhere else? No, we haven't found, uh, to my knowledge, we haven't found any banded birds uh, outside this area here. Um, so I think the, the West Coast ospreys uh, and the East Coast probably don't mix very often. But they are found in, on, on most continents. They're pretty widespread. Yes, I didn't know that until I traveled. I, was, I went to Yellowstone last. September and there were osprey all over there as well and I I had no idea. Yeah, no, they, they made a, a remarkable comeback, you know, from being decimated by DDT back in the you know, 60s and 70s and then, you know, in the early 80s we noticed that they're coming back and uh, we were prepared. We were prepared to deal with them here in the Bay. Very good. That was the last question that came in, so this is your last chance, everybody. Um, Don, any closing well, thoughts? Well, uh, you know, we, we have another, uh, we have a series of festivals each year. The next one is the Shorebird Festival, which will be held on August 22nd. And you can sign up on Eventbrite uh, through New York City Audubon, um, or you can go to uh, Jamaica Bay Rockway Park Conservancy. Uh, Alex Zablocki will be hosting it. Uh, I will be out in a boat that day, hopefully uh, broadcasting live from a site that we hope to see at Shorebirds. Shorebirds are starting to come through the bay right now. So even though we think it's midsummer for the bird world, this is the fall, beginning of fall migration. So that's Saturday, August 22nd from 10 a.m. till noon. And that is virtual. That is virtual. Everything is virtual. Okay. Yep. Except, um, again, we will we'll be doing some kayak programs with limited uh, numbers of people. You know, it, it can be safe if you have an individual kayak and you, you maintain distance and you wear masks. You know, uh, we, can, we can do these things, but we have to be adamant about making sure people are protected. And where can people sign up for that? That is through Jamaica Bay Rockway Parks Conservancy. And uh, if you'll hold on one second, let me get the date on that again. Well, and it's JBRP, J-B-R-P-C dot org. Um, so you all should see that in the chat uh, is Jamaica Bay Rockaway Park Conservancy um, website. And I'm sure that there's information listed there. Oh, I have it on my calendar for uh, for August 12th at 6 p.m. So this would be a limited, I guess. So you, you can check with them, but maybe we'll have more over the years, uh, the rest of the year. And then we'll be doing, uh, as part of the, uh, the Jamaica Bay Festival Day, on, it will be September 12th this year, City of Water Day. And I will be doing a kayak program on that day as well. Very good. Um, and um, Mary Jane wanted to know how can they send this presentation to others. So it was being recorded um, and it will be up on the American Literal Society's YouTube, ch YouTube channel and um, Facebook and Instagram TV. 
uh, probably in about a week or so. Sometimes we have some um, cutting to do on either end so that my awkward chatter is not included, um, but it should be available. Um, so check back there uh, at that time. And Mary Jane, I'm gonna write your name down so that I can send it to you specifically via email. Oh, that's a shout out to Mary Jane Kaplan, who is one of our great supporters and uh, board member of New York City Audubon and uh, been on many trips with me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Mary Jane. Yes, thank you. Um, and so thank you everybody who have tuned in. Um, again, you know, if you're interested in more things from the Literal Society, uh, visit us at literalsociety.org. You can become a member if you're not already one. Um, and that's where you'll find a whole list of virtual programs, past videos that you can watch, um, and lots of other things. We're also um, upping our presence on social media so you can follow both the um, Sandy Hook chapter and the Northeast chapter on Facebook and Instagram. And you'll often see um, Edgar the Egret and Heckle and Jekyll the Laughing Gulls and other um, I don't other see it. friends. Edgar was here earlier, but he didn't, he uh, didn't walk in to uh, say he hello. He didn't make an appearance for this webinar. Um, but you can find lots of those things on our website and again on our various social media channels. Um, and we hope to see you soon, whether virtually or fingers crossed in person um, as soon as we can. So thank you again. Thank you, Don. Um, and we'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks. Bye.